Oh my goodness, this is going to be fantastic. Okay, I'm going to hang up the phone. I think you're in. Oh my goodness, look at this amazing technology. Hi, Jefferson. Yeah, How are you? Late. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how it happens. If that's how it happens, that's how it happens. I'm, are we on right now? Yeah, we are, we are live. Hi, there yeah. might be a couple of people still hanging around. How do we feel about that? Eight, there's eight people watching this. Okay. How terrific. Uh, but you're a little blown up, but that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just like, you guys see. On the YouTube. It's worse. Yeah, it might, be, it might be on my end. Okay. All right, so Willis is here. We're, we're in my living room. Uh, we, you, so, so just to give the audience and Jefferson an update, um, this week has been kind of crazy for everybody. Uh, so welcome to the first ever off-site video chat uh, artist conversation <laughs> that we've ever had to put together. I am, yeah, yeah, totally. I am in my living room, uh, but next to my, my living room projection screen. Um, Willis is here, my partner. Um, Jefferson is in Chicago. Had just uh, had a miserably long day, probably uh, related to coronavirus issues at School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, which is, yeah. of, of course, why we aren't at SFAI like we were su supposed to be. Um, and uh, SFAI actually closed, so we couldn't even do this in the installation. So uh, what, you, what you can't see, Jefferson, is that I have your, uh, your artwork projected behind us. Um, I have uh, I have excerpts of This Is Not a Drill and Float and Elaine that are going to be playing full screen uh, behind us as we have this talk. And um, yeah, and then we have some YouTube people that are chiming in via this wonderful little Mevo device. So this may be the new paradigm. <laughs> Hopefully not for long. Uh, but here... It's kind of scary, but... <laughs> yeah, here we... At least the next few months. Yeah, it looks like it. Is that what Chicago's talking? Are they talking months? Yeah, well, we're talking about, like, the end of, of, of spring. At least the beginning of summer. And, um... Oh, man. Yeah, I know. This is the new normal for at least for a little while. Is that going to scramble graduation times and scramble, uh... Well, right now, we're not even sure yeah. about graduation time. It's kind of, like, on a hold, holding pattern, and we'll see how it goes. Wow. Um... This is, this is uncharted territory, man. This is just like, you know, nothing that anybody could have predicted. Um, and I hope that, you know, we pull through and, and that, that folks are safe. But honestly, it, it's, it, I think we're all just trying to play catch up here. Yeah, right, on a daily basis. I feel like everything I plan for tomorrow is already abandoned by morning. Uh, it's right. been like that three or four days in a row. So again, I can't, I, thank you so much for even having this conversation. I mean, um, so, so, I, I, you know, <laughs> some of our eight fans out there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. People may, well, people will watch for this. You. Just, it's for you, eight fans. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's yeah. my audience. That's all right. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, so, so, and you and I have spoken about this a little bit about what this, uh, what these talks usually are, and they're usually to lend some level of, uh, legacy to your archive. I, I like the idea of you as an artist looking back on uh, where you were at this moment and thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, you know this, this, this exhibition at SFA is coming to a close, it's traveling, um, you know, where, where, where were you, uh, you know, you're, you're finishing up this associate deanship, um, you know, just, just thinking about those things, the same thing for aggregate, you know, we're, we're just launching this new space. We're just on the cusp of uh, rebuilding and turning into something new. You know, we just finished this long period of collaboration with other organizations. So I, I think, um, you know, this is a, a, a pretty exciting time for both of us, hopefully. And hopefully and this is... Oddly. Yeah, oddly. I wish it was a little bit more mellow. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right, but hopefully we can go back and, like, look on this conversation and have a good laugh about it. And, uh, you know, maybe learn some things about where we are uh, when, when we look back on it in 10 years. I, I think we're going to have a lot of period time. I mean, it, I, I just hope that it's not going to cost too many people, you know? I mean, it, I think what I mean by that in the, in the broadest sense is just like people are, are, are anxious, they're, they're excited, and, you know, it, it's, it's 
like a kind of intensity that we're just not used to seeing and you just don't want um, this period of time to to take a chunk out of who we are and what I mean I'm thinking like not just like you know um, the virus I'm not talking about the virus I'm talking about how we treat each other right um, I think that's what I'm, I'm most concerned about because so a lot of this is um, right now I mean I have a, a, this this person who lives underneath me she's, she's a surgeon and she's like saying you know I, I understand that the coronavirus is, is extremely serious but people are, are, are dropping dead from, from the flu this year right it's dead tens of thousands of people so I, I think there's just um, all different kinds of aspects and facets of like what this is and, you know I think it's going to take us a long time to sort it out but we're going to learn a lot from it I can't help but to think that I hope so you know the, 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 <laughs> we're going to learn how to do things online <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we're going to learn how to teach online yeah it, uh, I had a, a, a friend of mine Friend of mine teaches ceramics and uh, you know has been instructed to teach their class online, and they're just pulling their hair out. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you're dealing with that same thing. Like, how do you teach welding yeah. and uh, performance? Yeah, well, you know, I think you document it. <laughs> yeah, right. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting documentation, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the lively or the live aspect of all of this is, is going to have to be put on hold and that's, that's really unfortunate because I think that's what makes it special but um, meanwhile I mean it's you know as, as we're, we're laying low I think there's a lot that, that can be accomplished I mean I, I yeah. think that that's the only real way that you can look at this is like you can be optimist or not you right. know it's, uh, the truth is I mean this, this could also be really grim but I, I can't help but think that we're, we're going to recover and we're going to be better for it in the end so, so where does this hopeful side of Jefferson Pinder come from? I, uh... <laughs> How's that for a first question? Well, so, yeah. To figure out how to balance it, you know? Because I don't, I don't know typically if I'm always so hopeful, but I, I think in this situation, I mean, I think that it is a, it's a... At this point, it's a... I think it's, it's a social crisis that, that has a potential to be a lot more, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but right now we're dealing with a lot of just um, people who are, who, are, who are, you know, coming to terms with the, the reality that something's coming. We're not quite sure what it is, but it's fear, right? Yeah. I think that, well, that's what we're wrestling with. Yeah. And but it's, anyway, we're going to be... I like what you were saying. We're going to be... That, that perhaps yeah. we'll remember, we'll still sit back and we'll remember this whole period of time and we can technicalize Flashpoint with, or at least the, you know, the end of Flashpoint with this, this virus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, right, to, to think through, um, the direction to take this conversation. I mean, I usually, you know, go step by step and try to think about, uh, like, a how, how, how did an artist get to this point? But it seems, that seems like such a, uh, more complicated, more broad statement than, um. Uh, than I'm used to. I mean, especially after after the last few days. I mean, Jesus. Um, so, so I, I met you uh, as a it was your last year of graduate studies at University of Maryland, and you were there. Um, what did you consider your your major in that MFA? Because I know that um, University of Maryland had uh, you know you kind of had to pick your focus for your right, master's. Exactly. Which is which is different than like say an art school like SAIC where your focus is uh, you know what you want it to be but on everybody pretty much gets the same diploma right, right. yeah, yeah. Um, there's no majors at SAIC but at the University of Maryland um, it was painting of all things hmm. I mean I focused on, on painting I did not know um, that and for years I I, I wrote mixed media on my resume until I realized that well we don't really have a mixed media. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm claiming my own Bachelor of Arts, you know. Right. I mean, it was a BA program, too, as you know. I mean, I think, and it was beautiful because of that. I think we, we learned a lot of other things. Um, it forced us to go in classes with physicists and chemists and what have you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and inevitably, we had the art classes with a physicist who could draw better than anybody. Right. Um, <laughs> right. But, right, yeah. So, I mean, it, things, can, I think a liberal arts education kind of balances itself out. Um, so, you know, the work I was doing back in those days was really derivative of uh, Romeo Bearden. Mm -hmm. Remember, like the collage artist, because I was just so in love and enamored with 
how he cut paper, uh-huh. how he laid it on the surface, and then gradually, uh, um, over time, I think it was maybe my, my thesis show, and, and you know, and I was encouraged to do a video piece. Uh-huh. You know, my background is in theater, so that's what I studied at the University of Maryland was theater. And that was your your and, bachelor's uh, program. That was a bachelor's program, and um, actually, yeah, I guess I, I mentioned bachelor's. I meant I meant my my Yeah. Um, I know that's a, that's a problem when you have like <laughs> all these degrees from the same place you get you all mixed up. Um, but the thing with the, the, the theater degree was uh, I, I thought that I had left it behind when I did my master's in mm-hmm. MFA. Um, I thought that that was actually um, in the past. Uh, but you know, Pat Gray, you know, my professor at, at the University of Maryland, yeah, right. uh, he saw me struggle with painting and he's like, well, why don't you just cut paper? Or, you know, and, and I, I began to cut paper, and then um, he's like, well, why don't you make a video? And this is what, in the, the late 90s, early 2000s? Yeah. And it was just pretty um, liberating, the idea that, that perhaps I, I was just thinking really narrow. Mm. And I was spending all this time trying to work on a, a craft of, of painting when, when really was, what was most important was, was trying to think about all, all these things came together and what, what, what made all of the, the cut paper the theater, the videos come together was, was, was me and my experience. Right. Um, and, and, and it took me, I think that was the biggest takeaway from grad school, actually, mm-hmm. is that it didn't have to be one thing, rather that the whole um, experience of, um, of being an artist wasn't, um, wasn't narrowly defined by, by, by me, you know, being in a studio trying to pretend to be something that I really wasn't. Right. <laughs> Right. I, had, I had everything that I needed, and, and then it was uh, about learning the other things that you need to know for a project or a piece, and, and figuring out how to, how to push that forward so that um, the work is representative of the concept of the idea. Right. right? Yeah. And, and so they made a conceptual artist out of me. <laughs> <laughs> At the uh, University of Maryland, of all places. Willful, but that's what happened, huh? Yeah, of all places, University of Maryland made you a conceptual artist. Yeah. I mean, well, so. Yeah what, yeah, what pushed you into the into the theater department in the first place? What was your what was your do you like do you, if you go back to yourself as a, a an even younger man? What what was your goal with that degree? I think there were th- there were things that I wanted to to say with my work, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I at first I, I thought I had you know this tool um, of expression through theater. That, I mean I felt like in the moment I could. I could really uh, command the space, and mm-hmm. I, I could present myself as, as other things. I, I, but at the same time, it was all a part of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love scene work. I love the intensity of, like you know, the, all the lights and the drama and the spectacle on a stage. I even like um, the idea of the, all of the rituals with theater, like the ghost light ritual, like that. There's always a light burning on the stage, or right. uh, that you never to whistle on the whistle. Uh, I mean, on the stage rather, and, and that you um, that there's certain colors that you can wear. There's almost like this stage superstition, which kind of like borderline on, on the idea of spirituality, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, think, and I don't know many theater people who are religious, but all, uh, almost all of them are spiritual in, in that respect. That that they really believe in creating that moment. And mm-hmm. If you don't believe in that moment, one hundred and ten percent, then then why are you doing the work? Right. So I mean, this was the this was the, the ground, and this was the foundation. Which I mean, I think my whole practice was built. And I didn't I was I didn't have enough imagination to know where it would take me. Right. But um, you know, but grad I went to grad school in theater at Florida State University for one semester, mm-hmm. and um, and I realized that I I, I had my own ideas. Mm-hmm that I, I didn't want a script that someone would give me. Um, I didn't want a director telling me if I was capable or not of doing something or, or accomplishing work. So I was just self you know, motivated to, to create my own productions and my own pieces, and that kind of led to, to the video work. Right. You know? um, and oddly, you know, the art, <laughs> the art and plastic art the collage came into it and, and really helped me to understand like, um, things like editing and cuts. And, you know, a torn edge versus a you know a straight edge, and how these things can come together, and how how something is malleable, how materials are malleable, and performances are as well. Um, you know, it's not as much about you know the 
the first move or the second move as much as it is about the 52nd move or the 130th move or you know, the 12,000th move. You know, so like all these things are happening, and you have to react to them. It's it's right. not that there's one linear path, rather there's there's actually a variation of many paths, and you, and you just have to figure out how to respond um, most genuinely in the moment to whatever path that you're on. Mm. You know? So I think it's that a lot of the theater stuff really fueled um, my performance work. Mm -hmm. It's it's so it's funny that you say that the, the you know the the moment fuels the um, the piece uh, because uh, Elaine just came on the projection um, mm -hmm. and so you know the people that are watching this are watching you kind of walk away from camera to this this um, this grave um, and I I you know the the works in Flashpoint uh, largely are uh, don't star. Jefferson Pinder, the performance artist, they're they're starring you know larger groups or performance groups, um, you know beyond this piece in Sonic Boom and I, I like what what was it that made you start to lean away from works that starred starred yourself, uh, you know works that were largely about yourself and have them be about something, you know that required a, a larger group to help you with the performance. I think I got fatigued mm. of mm. that idea of starring, you know, like, right. like somehow I was trying to get to much bigger issues and, and I always had to deal with myself. And that's not really that much different than what I'm doing now. I'm still dealing with myself in the work, but mm. I, I'm not confronted with the, my physicality. I, actually working with other people has really empowered me to, to speak more. And there's a wider range. It's a more of an open palette, if you mm. will. I mean, if you want to use a, a painting expression. I mean, the idea that um, I could use or work with somebody who has a physique that's really different than mine, and maybe the piece will be that much better because of it. You know, right. that, um, if I'm working um, with somebody who has, and I can see it, that's another thing. I mean, when I was doing my performance pieces, even Elaine, I don't, I didn't know what it looked like until it was done, until weeks later when I had the courage to look at it. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I just I perform the action, but while I'm working with other people, what's it's exciting is that I have a different kind of control over the work. Mm -hmm. I, I can see it from the outside. I can actually spend much more time with the work. Yeah. I can spend more time editing it and looking at it on a museum wall or um, like SFAI. I think if, if if every single video had me in it, I, I just think I, I would I would get tired of, of it myself. Yeah, right. It, it's a much tougher conversation saying that I can fit into all these scenarios. Yeah. Whereas, you know, there, like with Elaine, that, that was, I was there, it was in the moment, and, and we had to, to capture it. Mm -hmm. And it made sense for me to be there and be present. Right. But for, this is not, not a drill. I mean, I tried to incorporate myself in the work, and it just, I was constantly getting in, I was getting in the way. It could to be outside the work and in the work. Mm -hmm. And, and I know some people do it marvelously, and sometimes I think I can get away with it as well, but most of the time I want to be able to, to be the impresario, to be able to conduct the action. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's my role. I mean, and, and being able to not be visible is, 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 is kind of a, it's kind of a wonderful thing. The work kind of carries on, and it, it becomes much bigger than you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so can you, can you just to step back, can you talk about that first video piece that Pat Craig, uh, you know, what, what was the piece that came out of that? Yeah, Professor Craig. Um, it was, the first piece that I made was, um, oh God, what was it? Processional. Hmm. And it, it, it started from, the, I don't know if you remember Drew Borlas, but uh, he was a grad student who hmm. um, saw that I was trying to emulate the textures from a telephone pole on a flat canvas. Oh my god, I remember those pieces. They were so good. Yeah, yeah. I no, I just I just remember when you were trying to uh, I, I haven't thought about that in years. So Je so Jefferson made this this body of work based on like the the texture of neighborhoods that would that'd be overlaid on telephone poles, like the the like decades of staples that are left behind from things that I mean you could you could speak about it more but Oh my god, it was amazing. It was amazing. I can't stop smiling because I just thought it was only in my head to remember that I remembered that because I, I, no. I forgot the, you know, the other you know, folks. Because you move on, I mean, like anything, like most artists, you, you, you're working and you're invested in a project and then it shifts and changes. Yeah. And then you go into whatever's no. new. But for me, it, it was actually really like a 
a big moment because I was trying to do this on a flat surface and the sculptor, you know, Drew, walked into my studio and, and was like, why are you trying to do this on a flat surface? It's like, if you're trying to emulate the textures on a telephone pole, you should get a telephone pole up in here. And, <laughs> it, 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 you know, as a collage artist who, you know, almost borderline illustrator at that point, it just, the idea of like, um, doing work on a telephone pole just seemed amazing. I remember that hurricane that passed through the campus and knocked down some it was so serendipitous. Yeah, right. And all of a sudden, like, I had this, like, I had a telephone pole in the middle of my field. <laughs> but that's not, but that's not the, what, what, what got me into performance. It was actually moving the telephone pole around the studio space it was infinitely more dynamic than what I was making on the telephone pole. <laughs> so it's like, it's like so the, the flat surface went to the, the, the 3D surface, and the 3D surface went to some performance, and, and I started think, think, documenting that. And so, I created a piece called Processional, in which I'm moving that telephone pole from, um, you know, College Park campus to, to you know, Brookland, wow. which is, you know, a section of Washington, D.C., and, and it was like, it, and it made sense, everything made sense, mm. it was like a moment where you're like, okay, the performance makes sense with the collage, the collage makes sense with this 3D object, and that was, I was an uh, interdisciplinarian, and I didn't even really think much of it, Wow. It was just manipulating the object and actually moving that object was because I remember I had to hold it like this to be able to move it from <laughs> one corner of my studio to another because I couldn't do it any other way. Yeah. And um how, and that was the how most tall was part it? of that piece. It was taller than you. It wasn't I mean it was like five feet, five and a half. But it was feet, just so was stinking like heavy. Five hundred yeah. pounds. Yeah. I I, I, I have like memories that. of that. I mean that was <laughs> That would have been my my first semester, so that would have been yeah. That would have been that was that was your last semester, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that would have been my, my first. You know, it was it was transformative, and, and then after wow. that was a piece called Marathon. And Marathon, yeah, I think you can still see on my website. Processional's not up there, but Marathon was was the video that I shot. Um, actually, that uh, Stevie Cohen shot, and um, Jeff Stein that documented that. Mm. on super 8 millimeter film and then we transferred it to video right uh, it, it, it was such an interesting process because i mean i remember getting that the, the footage back and, and thinking that this this isn't as good as video i mean there's <laughs> all these weird like effects it's like it's, right. the camera is like the, the registration was off it was stuttering it, it uh -huh. just didn't seem to make any sense that I would have something that was so imperfect, and, and that's when Stevie said to me, um, you know, I collaborated for that project, and she's like, look, this is what, this is what film does. Right. And I think that was really kind of an important statement at the right time, and she, she was saying, okay, look, this is the documentation you have of your performance piece, and, it, and it's right just the way it is. Yeah. And, um, and so that, that was the first work, and you know what, in many ways, I feel like I'm still catching up to that piece. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the best ever made. I, it, it is a so, question for y'all. So we got some feedback that the projection in the back is maybe not relating to the conversation. And I wonder if we could, I know Jefferson can't see it, but I wonder, I know it's not customary, but can we talk about what's behind you so it's a little more uh, engaging? Yeah, we can, we can talk a little bit about, so, so Float's playing right now. One of, one of the people, uh, okay. one of our great, gracious I want to swing back to Marathon because there's, there's things about that that I think are really intriguing about a piece of work. Um, but so, so Float, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a piece of work that required over a hundred collaborators, um, you know, that this, this, this stepping from, you know, the work that you were making about just yourself to, to something like Float, like, w what was that process like? Um, you know, to generate such an incredible piece of work. And, and um, uh, we can put a description of Float on the YouTube site um, nice. via uh, the descriptions of the exhibition so people can learn more about what the oh, piece yeah. itself was um, with verbiage. But I'd rather, I'd rather use this time to, to kind of hear about what, what your process was like. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it's... Hmm. I'm trying to think the best way of describing it. Well, okay, how about this? I, I've been fascinated with the death of Eugene Williams, I say for probably over over ten years. Okay. And it's weird when you're fascinated with how someone dies.
is, but the idea of like a, a young black boy floating on an inner tube, or when I say young, a young man rather, is a 17 year old man who, who was floating on an inner tube um, and went from an area where he was safe and where he was relaxed to an area where he found himself in, in danger mm-hmm. and then caught, you know, the edge of a brick and, 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 and you know, sank into the water and drowned. And what happened was, uh, you know, the beginning of the, what they call the Chicago race riot, right? Um, which I, I think I'm going to, from here on in, we'll talk about it as an uprising, but I think it's important to acknowledge how people have, have, have portrayed it. Um, so this happened at around 29th Street Beat in, in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And this started um, an epic battle between African Americans and, and whites in, in Chicago. And part of my fascination was is is that it is our it is our vulnerability mm-hmm. and our fear. You know, every I don't know if everybody knows, but I think a lot of people know that um, there's a considerable amount of black folks that have fear of water. Mm-hmm. Part of that fear it, it comes from a lot of different places. Um, one of which is is, is vulnerability. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I also think about. Also, like this history of segregation, um, these these I guess the safe areas where, where, where blacks could go in the water and, and could enjoy the beach, um, but I guess there's always the, that fear of, of possibly drifting or ending up somewhere where you don't belong. And and for this case, this case of um, Eugene Williams, he was in a, a flotational device in in a, you know and just floating in the water um, Mm -hmm. and drifting and ended up in a place where uh, he wasn't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that this is the history. This this is is killed by a group of um, white kids Mm -hmm. who didn't want him in that space. So what does it mean 100 years later? Yeah. And what does it mean um, for us to be at, at um, the 31st Street Beach, which is in close proximity to, you know, where Eugene Williams died? Mm-hmm. And what has changed? Yeah. And I guess in my imagination, I thought of all these incredible things that I could do to commemorate his death 100 years later. Um, but I think the most simple thing was, I, I believe, the best option, which is just to get people in the water. And just have them float. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I spent a, a lot of time thinking about monuments and, and, and memorials, but ultimately, I mean, I think this is almost like a, a, a gesture or you know a sketch, if you will, of of, of the potentiality of, of where we're at now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that, that an interracial um, or a mixed group of people can get in the water, and we can hold hands or we can link ourselves together. And make a statement to history. I think for me, history. I mean, I, I want to interact with history. I think mm-hmm. all of my work is about interacting with history. I mean, it's. I can't help it. I mean, I think part of, part of the, the realization with my work is that um, is there certain things that you can't change. But but the most empowering thing about making our work is that you're beginning to create a conversation mm-hmm. and. And in, in some part, your presence in certain spaces like museums and institutions um, really is a statement into itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had to show at the High Museum in Atlanta, and they wanted me to create this 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 video work um, in which spoke to the African American experience since 1968. Right? Yeah, no problem. This is some crazy, crazy shit they make you do when you're a young artist. Now I think, I don't know, I think I would challenge it a little bit more, but, you know, of course I was like, okay, let me make something, let me make a piece about it. And then at some point I realized, you know what, I can go to the museum and do jumping jacks. And and, and, and right. that is a piece about progress. Right. Okay? Because I am there, my physical presence is there. In 1968, I wasn't, I wouldn't be allowed in that museum. Right. So it's, it's like, we, we want to balance all, all the different elements in each. I think sometimes, you know, the more simple gestures are the best, and I think that's what floats about, just right. getting people together, placing them in that space, yeah, I, and, and trying to see what would happen yeah. and how it would emerge. Er, early on, you described that, uh, you know, just that the act that they were all in the water holding hands means that what happened couldn't, couldn't happen now. 
and that that itself is, uh, you know, that it, it makes the artwork an act of, um, uh, you know, just just a, pre a presentation that that couldn't possibly happen. That that's the um, the activist notion of it, and um, I I don't know. It, it's it's such a calm, um, wonderful version of a memorial, um, you know, and I think. I think a lot of our best memorials, I mean, as, you know, you and I went to school in D.C., and, you know, you're surrounded by all of those conversations and, you know, what's good and what's what's not good and, you know, what, what makes you really feel the right things in a memorial, and I think that that's, that's really something special that you've kind of created, that it just, it just is. It is this, these 100 people that are, that are together, 100% uh, negating what happened. Um, you know, it is, it and I think Chicago has an interesting history of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, for case in point, the, the Irish, you know, the Irish parade that mm -hmm. happens every year. They dye the water in, in um, the Chicago River green. Mm -hmm. But I think what is the most powerful element that they never talk about, because everybody is too focused on the Irish community, you know, coming out, having a blast, and God knows how many people are drunk that, that day every year. Right. But the most powerful thing is, is in, they will march through the south side of Chicago in the neighborhoods that were formerly Irish. Mm. And, and, it, and it's like, okay, you're going to have to deal with us for this one day because we work here. You right. know, we, we, I think it's almost, uh, it's, it's very much about occupying space. Huh. And it's, 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 it's super powerful. I don't think, you know, gosh, I'm trying to think if, if black folks could march through gentrified neighborhoods. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. Somehow, like, since they okay, we were here at it, it would be, it would be considered a riot, you know? I mean, I right. don't think that it, it works the same. I don't think there's the same agency. But as an assimilated group that has done really, um, for the most part, I think it's done well and collectively for itself to assimilate in our society. I think that that's the one time of the year that, you know, uh, uh, I would say that um, an ethnic white community is like, you know, the, you know, the South Side, we we're here. Right. I mean, and I think <laughs> that's a powerful thing when they're marching through black neighborhoods. Um, so I'm thinking also about space wow. and occupying space and what it means for us to just be present there um, as a memorial. Um, and so I think that, you know, processionals are important. Um, this, this, the idea of floating is, is meditative idea. And, and we don't usually think of black folks in meditation. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that it, it, it's it's somewhat abstract. I think you think about black folks' attention. Yeah. But what does it mean for for us to be in a relaxed, you know, you know, environment where it kind of borders between, um, you know, not knowing that there's risk of the water where anything can happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but at the same time, it's 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 kind of what you're doing it with so many other people that that even if moments where. I think we had started to lose control of that actual performance because our, our inner tubes were, were, were constantly drifting. Mm. And, you know, similar to Eugene Williams in, that, in the day 100 years ago, uh -huh. um, exact same time, exact same place, we found ourselves quickly, like, getting pulled out into the lake. <laughs> so that's a, a terrifying of reminder. You know. and, yeah, no, they don't allow flotational devices in Lake Michigan for that reason. Oh, wow. And we, and we found out really quickly why. You know, sometimes they have rules and you're like, I don't understand that why that rule exists. But <laughs> when, we, when we got in the water that day and, and 100 people began to slowly, you know, get pulled into the lake, it, it got really frightening. Wow. And, it, and, and I, you know, I thought maybe the piece should be tied with drift because it, <laughs> it was about not just staying static in one place, like maybe our current title suggest but instead like what happens when you start off in one location and you end up in another and and, the, and how much energy it takes you to, to keep you from 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 moving away um hmm. so uh, yeah I, I think it's something that i don't know if it's captured in the video piece so much um but it was a reality of, of the performance well I, I mean i think that you you you've become a very astute uh video maker and i and i think when i when i um this past week, I went back and watched Marathon uh, on your website, and um, you know, there, there's there's always these rules when I've taught video that I've given to students 
and one of them always is that your piece needs to work in some way at, on the second, any second of the video. And float, um, it does that. It, there's a serenity and a, a, a companionship um, amongst the people, and there's a, there's a moment that you're creating that is uh, me meditative is a really good word for it. Um, and the same thing with, with, with marathon, there's an intensity and a, like you, you see somebody running for their life at any moment of that. And, uh, you know, other than the last very, the very few. Um, right. But, you know, the, the, there's, there's... It's almost like a collapse, a breakdown, you know? Yeah, I, but I, I just think that, like, you know, there, there's an electricity to, to that piece of work, just like there is to, to float almost in the opposite sense, where it's just this this calmness that you generate immediately, two seconds, 15 seconds, you you get that there's this community on, on the water. Um, and uh, that's that's really interesting. And I, and I think it, 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 it stands, I mean, your, your anecdote about, um, I had no idea about that uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day tradition of, of the Irish marching through Southside. That's crazy. Um, and, uh, and and this is not a drill is now I mean, I think that is now playing. Yeah, I mean I think it's crazy in certain respects, but then also think about like like what we're talking about. What is a memorial? You right. know? And it's it I mean, sure, um and we know from from being artists and makers that like sometimes the ephemeral is, is the stuff that stays with you so long. Yeah. It's something that's you can't quite explain that seems to be moving. You can't track because it's um Maybe ethereal, but I think that's the the place I want to exist. You know, I think that making an iron, you know, cast of of maybe Eugene Williams would be one thing, but to actually get people in that space is almost experiencing similar risks at, as serious as you know at, at the same time a hundred years ago that this um, young man was killed. It, it, I think that you, you can't. I don't think anybody who was a part of that experience will ever forget it. Right. Uh, I mean, I think, it, you know, the, the, the video documents, you know, the, I think the essence of it. But really, that performance was more for the participants, and that's very different than any of my other works. Yeah. I mean, the participants were, were the ones who experienced what it's like <laughs> to be in the lake on a flotational device, which I don't think anybody has done, <laughs> probably for, for decades, because it's, it, 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 they, they outlawed it. You know, so um, the city was uh, had allowed us to do it, and that was at the time. As a matter of fact, I wanted to see if we could do it this year, but it, I, I don't know if we'll be able to, to to do another piece on the lake. I, I think that wow. it, we had maxed out the lifeguards that day. Right. <laughs> they had, you know, out. So, uh, I mean, at a certain point, I realized that there, there was just a lot more risk involved than you would think just floating on, on a little, you know, inner tube. Right. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, again, it's it's important work. I mean, these are these are conversations that are. I mean, the. Uh, well, I guess how how actually, how do I pose this as a question? How do you feel about posing a question with a piece of work rather than answering it? And I think I think really that this is the difference between commercial work and non-commercial work. Um, you know, in, in, in you being. You, you thinking contemporarily and, and aggregate space being a nonprofit. I mean, nonprofits exist to to show work that isn't viable commercially. Like that's why we exist. Um, your right. your 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 colleague Kate Dumbleton, uh, I found a great piece of uh, on, on a, a video on online that where she explains what a nonprofit is, and it's brilliant. It's just that you know that it's what you know kind of what I just said. But really, just like if if nonprofits didn't exist, it'd cost a thousand dollars to go see the symphony, right? Because yeah. who's going to take care of that if it's not a nonprofit? I mean, it would be only for for forty people, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it's really brilliant. It was it was in a longer explanation, but it's I mean that's really what it is. That's why we exist. And I think in, in part it's the the art that you're making, the art that you're you know the questions that you're asking the. Um, you know the 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 sociology that you're um, leaning into to is is key 
for our society. Like we need to be asking these questions. We need to be holding these conversations. And so I, I don't know how does it how does it um, how do you feel like a piece like float allows you to continue a conversation? You know maybe it's uh, you know many people have forgotten these this young man, um, but you know it's it's vastly more complicated than that. And it, again, it asks more questions than it answers, which I think is something that you're very very um, astute at, at producing in your work. Well, thanks. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I still need. I think the interaction is, is so exciting mm -hmm. that, that I'm I'm interacting with history in, in almost a futurist sense that, that I'm I'm kind of changing the past or the perception of the past. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like um, you know, just quickly go off road and talk a little bit about Ben Hur, <laughs> which is a, a piece I did where these. Um, these men are rowing on these machines, um, and, and it's uh, you know an homage, or you know it somehow it it, it, it you know gives uh, a nod to the the Ben Hur flick of uh -huh. Trump Heston, where they're, they're slaves on, on the bottom of the ship, right? Yeah. They're, they're rowing in a slave ship, but when you see black slaves do it, you think about the Middle Passage, and but it does because black slaves weren't rowing ships across the ocean; they weren't. Right. But somehow, like. By putting these things in context, it, there's a little bit of slippage. Right. Because um, the whole experience is, is not like, um, it wasn't documented, or rather, I should take that back, it, it was documented, but it wasn't documented visually through like like photographs or videos. So, right. So somehow, it, um, this performance like slips into space where you're beginning to think about maybe other things in relationship to, let's say, the history of, of blacks crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love this because in a way it's, it's, a, it's a, I'm not defining what that experience is. I'm just putting something on the table and you're kind of finishing that circle, but it's always imperfect. It's, yeah. always, it, it's, not, it's never a perfect circle, but somehow if I leave a little bit of gap and I'm telling the audience to finish it, we're going to go somewhere that's different than, than, than where history has led us or where the performance um, is, is guiding the performers. So you, you have this slippage in this area where people are beginning to re-see history in a different way. And, and to right. me, that, that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, that's, that somebody will look at my Ben Hur piece and, and think, were those slaves crossing the ocean? And I'm like, that's crazy, but it's, it's not. Right. You know, it, right. It, it just it opens know, the door to you know, those thoughts. Same with the, say, say what? Oh, it just it opens the door to that thought. Yeah. It opens the door to that thought, and, and perhaps that's what you say, like um, asking a lot of questions. I mean, it's it to me, it's kind of poking holes in history and getting us to to be able to understand the essence, but maybe not the details. Yeah. We all got out of the water that day, no matter how focused we were to thinking about Eugene. There, there were smiles, there were smiles, it was a, a mixed in a race group, mm -hmm. and we all, we all got out of the war. Right. So, yeah, I guess, it, I, I like this idea, what you're saying, that, that, that we're asking, or that I'm asking a lot of questions, me and, and my collaborators, and I, I think that that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's great, because I don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, I would be a hypocrite to say if I did, or a hypocrite to say that I even really completely understand it, but I think right. going through the motions, I think what we do is we understand it in our bodies. Yeah. I mean, that's connected to something I think even ultimately more re real than anything we could think of. It's, it's almost like the physiological experience of flowing in the water and drifting from one load to another uncontrollably. Yeah. That's what we can connect to. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, and I, I mean, I think there's, there's something really beautiful about... Um, Accepting, accepting that you don't have all the answers, you know, and that that being being surrounded by um, by by work that accepts that with you. I mean, I think there's there's a general, um, you know, especially in in the, I, I mean, not to go not to go too political, but like in the in the world of news channels and um, you know constant advertising and social media, like there's a there's a expectation that everybody's got everything figured out. I don't think anybody does. I think that you, you, you it's, you know, it's varying degrees of pretending what we have figured out. 
you know, and and to to kind of just to use to use your voice um, to to put people in that position of being, you know, it's okay, it's okay that it's not it's not all the way put together. You know, it's, that we're going to be there together. I mean, it's, and then that's that's where all the, the beautiful things happen is is that, that not not knowing. I think if I had figured it all out, it would be really boring hard. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of you know, it's trying to figure out how we can engage in these issues or mm -hmm. engage in this the thought process or, or, or being in the moment. Um, and and I, that's what, what I'm taking away from my theater background is, is the importance of just being honest. And, and being really genuine in that moment and, and letting that lead to something that that's powerful. I mean, I, I have a really imperfect practice. Mm. And sometimes I feel like um, someone asked me the other day, how often do you make something that you really like? And I had to sit and think about that. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, maybe once every couple years? I think that's right. It's not to say that I'm not doing good work because the work is about the process, but... Right. Every once in a while, you know, you'll, you'll hit it, and you know you'll hit it, but most of the times, I mean, I'd be a liar to say that most of the times, um, I'm, I'm really searching, and I'm hoping, and, and that, that piece wasn't quite there, that piece, I mean, if only I had changed it, and then I'm, of course, you know, I'm, I'm super critical of myself and yeah. the work, but then when I, I, I am able to hit that note just right, I mean, that makes it even more rewarding, right? right? Because this, honestly, um... I mean, it's. I mean, my practice is is has really like taken on a lot, and, and, it's, and I'm I'm doing a lot of different things, and I'm trying to balance it out, and I'm never doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Sometimes I wish I was, but I, I I'm just too curious. I'm just right. too curious. Well, that's the right spot to be. I mean, don't don't get bored with that, please, for for all of us. <laughs> um. So so this is not a drill. Is is now is now playing. Um. And. Uh, it's playing without sound and you know we're about 10 minutes into it as it's kind of plays in the background of this conversation but I mean could, could okay. you talk a little bit about that process because it's so it's so very different than the the other two pieces that we've been talking about uh, that being Elaine and, um, and Float you know this is a piece where you brought in performers it's a highly choreographed um, you know sh aggressively shot piece of work that um, doesn't, it's not such an easily quantifiable thing as the other two pieces. Like it doesn't, it, there's not a beginning, middle, and end to the, what, to the piece. Yeah. No, did we lose you? Are you, oh. talking, are you oh. talking about this is not a drill? Yes, I am, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, that was a process. That, that boy, that, you know, this time last year I, I was working on with a small group of performer generally about is similar as, as float. Um, we're thinking about history mm -hmm. and we're thinking about physical preparedness for an inevitable conflict. Like, you know, if you know you're going to get dragged out of a police car, how do you get dragged out? If you know a cop is going to try to shoot you from behind, how are you going to run down the street? Right. How are you going to um, somehow protect yourself? You know, to to an, a, a, I guess a, a conceptual onslaught. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for us, I mean, it's not like we were actually dealing with, I guess, the physical onslaught, but knowing that uh, history has shown that black bodies, brown bodies have had to endure. So we were looking at um, all kinds of physical training mm -hmm. to prepare our bodies. Uh, we had three Marine Corps vets that were a part of this process um, that were teaching us hand drills um, you know hand drills are you know fisticuffs and what happens if someone grabs you you grab you, you twist bend you push it's like how do you how do you aestheticize the, the training of preparing a body mm -hmm. for a fight right um, so we began really slow and we knew the different elements we wanted to incorporate, but we also wanted to have some flexibility to want to incorporate text, different texts from, uh, I guess, uh, civil rights activists, um, poets like Joe Ross, and um, uh, you know, gosh, who else was was a part of that? Um, Fred Hampton. Mm. Uh, we had the eclipse from a 
Amari Baraka, um, and Dutchman. So we were just kind of throwing together a, a bit of a gumbo of, of different experiences. I, one of my colleagues at SAIC teaches um, in a black militant black militancy and um, in particular she she was she's writing a book about the Black Panther Party mm-hmm. and I wanted to ask her um, actually she's Indian American which is just it's the coolest part you know mm-hmm. I'm asking an Indian American about like Black Panthers and <laughs> she's giving me more information she's like well first of all you want to know how they were trained they they get prisons mm-hmm. uh, and the physical training wasn't the physical training that you might think the physical training was, was theater huh. because most of the times their guns weren't loaded even though contrary to popular belief most of the times the guns weren't loaded and they were feeding kids in the morning right yeah which was just kind of like she was telling me things that I knew but I just hadn't put it all together I was like oh yeah of course you know they look so smooth right you know they had the leather jackets <laughs> they had the buttons they had the parades they just they looked yeah. like you know you know it, I'm sure if you're a white man in the 60s, it looked like probably, you know, one of the more intimidating things you probably could see walking down the street. Right. It's a black man with a shotgun. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think the beauty is that it was a display, that that powerful display is what we remember. What we yeah. don't remember is that Martin Luther King sent, like, kids to get, like, bitten by dogs by Bull Connor and Birmingham. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like somehow we think about Martin Luther King as being the peaceful activist, but quite honestly, he probably led more children to get physically abused than Malcolm X or the Black Panthers ever did. Wow. So I think that, that almost like the, these juxtapositions are fascinating to me. It's like, I mean, if, if I'm working with a group of performers and we're training on how to prepare a body for a fight, that's real. Yeah. So this, I mean, somehow this is like, even though it, it may seem like theater, that the reality is that that um, the preparedness and the theatricality is it's almost as important or more important than actually training someone how to kill. Huh. In yeah. the same way that the British troops would wear red coats on the battlefield is to intimidate. I mean, because you think about red coats on the battle on the green battlefield, it's just like you would want to wear. You know, that, that's the worst thing possible to wear. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but like, what could stand out? But the truth is that that uniform intimidated people, so they couldn't load their weapons. Yeah, yeah. They just see it marching yeah, towards them. them. Yeah. They just saw a perfect formation of these people that seemed like like they really knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, that were extremely <laughs> trained, and most people didn't stay around the fight. You know, they took off. I love so that. It's, it's interesting. I think that yeah. perception of of physicality and of preparedness and of strength is is almost as, as stronger, if not stronger, than the reality of fight. Wow. <laughs> I'm doing your last call. Yeah, I, yeah no, it, it's it's interesting to me. I think that's what we in the group of people um, that I work with really kind of focused on. And yeah. I couldn't have worked with a better group of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, have you have you thought about turning so, that piece into a um, something that was more live, like something that was more performative? You know, we initially performed it at um, the Chicago Cultural Center and mm-hmm. in DC at the Source Theater, and and I'm still kind of trying. To, and I believe it or not, that the piece that, that you have in this space right now, I'm still messing with it now. Yeah. yeah. Still, I, I, I well, we've spoken know. about that a little bit. Yeah. I, I, want it to be done but I know that there, I think the performance the, there were three, certain things that were captured that I don't know if the, the, you know, the video is is, is, is showing right now mm-hmm. and I think that's always you know, something with documentation because it, in the end I don't know if I really have documentation I don't have mm-hmm. um, a piece that's not connected to the performance but I have almost like this hybrid that, that yeah. exists in this space and it's in manipulating that and, and, and trying to be honest and, and genuine in, in these moments, it, it's much harder to do because you have so much control. I, mean, I, I think that if you were there at the performance and saw the video piece, a lot more would make sense. Right. And trying to get that thing to stand on its own has, has been like, you know, something that, that, <laughs> that <laughs> maybe be fixed in the months to come. Yeah. Well, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, I, I know that you've been, you've been talking about that since since the show came together. But I, you know, ah, 
Jeez, yeah. I wish we could talk uh, a lot longer. Um, Can you but, thank the but, people that have joined? There's still nine people on. Yeah, I, so, so uh, Jefferson, I'm going to just take a minute. Th- I mean, all the uh, eight, nine people that are on this call, I mean, this is incredible. We've never done this before, so Yay. I can't believe that there's people <laughs> participating in this conversation uh, when it just feels like I'm in my living room talking to, talking to my old friend. Um, <laughs> Um, that, so this is all pretty incredible. So thank you all. It's nice. Um, thank um, you. Um, and I, I, um, I guess uh, just I want we're we're gonna switch over and take a few questions that have been filled out on the on the YouTube uh, channel. Um, but I guess um, you know ag- aggregate is figuring all all these things out. And so uh, those of you that are watching, you know we're we're in the process of trying to figure out what coronavirus means to an organization that prides itself on presenting in-person art experiences. Um, and we just moved and we were about to launch a big fundraising campaign and we're putting all that on hold. So, so donations are key, but also your support is key. So please reach out. Um, if you have ideas for what we can do to move things forward, we will uh, be appreciative. Um, and thank you for participating. And thank you for all of you that have seen Jefferson's show. And uh, thank you, Jefferson, for, for putting your all in this exhibition ha- halfway across the country. While I know that you were beyond busy this year, um, I hope it has legs. I hope Flashpoint keeps going and, and pops up here and there. I know it's going to Detroit next. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, me too. Have you had good conversations with Thomas? Just brief, just brief ones about what what, okay. what we can do to help and what we can what we can suggest the uh, best pra- best practices. But well, yeah, Conrad, I also want to say that I mean, the work that you put into the show is simply amazing. I mean, I think from painting that space, from like making hardware to hang the, the video projectors, I think at a certain point where I'm talking to this guy from Detroit, I'm like, I don't know if this show can move without Conrad. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, do we have questions, Willis? Do you have anything? Uh... We don't have any yet, but I think we're setting a precedent. Oh, we're setting a precedent for future questions. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 mean, I think I still have. Um, you know, I, what's next? I mean, beyond beyond Detroit, beyond Flashpoint, what what are you thinking about? What are you working on? What are what are ideas that you feel like you want to? Um, crack next. You know, I honestly, I had, I have a show at Patricia Sweeto. Great. Um, that's coming up in September, and it's an object-based show. Mm. Um, I right now I'm thinking a lot about uh, objects from the revolution, like what it would look like um, if people who don't have the the I guess the will to fight, um, you know, had armament, <laughs> or right. like, you know, what would it take if um, to get maybe more progressive people to, to, to be activated in, in, in that sense? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I'm making a, a, a series of objects, and I'm thinking about um, also the idea of surrender, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what does it mean to to give it, or is, or is there a heroic value in, in, in saying no to a fight? Hmm. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's, I'm talking to my mother, and uh, <laughs> my mom's 85 years old, and she crochets, and I'm thinking about oh. a, 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 um, a wonderful, little, like, beautiful white flag. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you know, I'm also I'm thinking about the selection, honestly, yeah. and I'm thinking about, like, what happens if... You know, there is a, a, a revolution, mm-hmm. or if, 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 if there, you know, these oppressive forces, you know, bear down on the left, I just don't think we have a chance. Yeah, right. I, don't, I, I wonder how prepared we are. I think, like, these militias are getting ready for this right now. Um, so I think that what I'm thinking about is the irony and mm-hmm. the humor um, of this idea of, like, just, oh, a beautiful... Either a beautiful fight or beautiful surrender.
surrender what, what, what kind of protection there wouldn't be much protection at all or, what is you know, the what's the armor you wear to surrender right really beautiful crystallized weapons that just don't function <laughs> or, oh you know, man this is armor that, that you know did you ever see that on the miniseries Chernobyl I didn't catch it no well they have like these um these uniforms that they had um the Russians wear when they had to deal with radio- radioactivity right and at a certain point you're looking at it and you're just like thinking it's not protection right <laughs> it's really cool to look at but <laughs> they're gonna die right and somehow they Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about armor. I'm thinking about like um. That's dark. Weaponry. And yeah, it is. I mean, it's. It, it, I think it was one of the most powerful moments in, in that miniseries is watching these young men doing this task that are not not like equipped. But you know, I mean, you put a football helmet on somebody, wrap a whole bunch of towels around their face, and you know, put shoulder pads on them, and say, okay, remove that radioactive like <laughs> piece of metal from the top of this roof. Well, yeah, that's not going to work, but it, it, it might wow. help them to do the tag. So I guess um, I've been thinking about that. I've also been thinking about screenplays, actually. Oh, good. I've been thinking that if I, if I get enough time, I've got a couple of really great ideas for, for bigger, um, say, outside of the gallery space projects. Excellent. Um, yeah, and one that I, I want to do about Cape Town and, and South Africa, and oh, okay. one that's about a graffiti artist that lives in Baltimore and all places. People said they appreciated so, um, yeah, you talking on, about the. Just take some questions. Actually, you know, my, my um. People like you, you all talking about the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh sure, yeah, okay. yeah. Cool, okay. and and while while Jefferson's doing that, I don't know if I can hear me online. Let me just check. Um, but just a couple comments from the audience. Um, Jessica Santone says, you all are awesome. Oh, thank you. And uh, Toria Cumming says, it's a great show. <laughs> and I promise to pass it on, which I am now. Great. Um, and then Jessica commented that uh, it's so interesting to see performance documentation in this almost sculptural, immersive way. Scale is so important to conveying the embodiment. Oh, Yes. And, and then Jessica was encouraging us to keep talking about the revolution. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, when Jefferson returns, I'll... I'll, I'll I, oh, excellent. It was an intermission? That was a, just brief. No, I, we're going to wrap this up soon. I don't know how, many, how long people... I mean, I guess the coronavirus has everybody sitting on their asses, but maybe this is an hour and 15 minutes is too long. No, we're doing great. We're doing great, it's, uh, everyone says. Okay, everyone. Everyone. All seven people. Five to six people. Um, I, so scale. So one, one of those questions, I don't know if you caught that, was about the scale of these works and how important it is to participate, um, or you know how, how refreshing it was to participate in your exhibition where the works were treated so sculpturally and where human scale yes. was very much taken into account. Um, and I, I'm gonna just partially answer this while you think about your answer, but a part of that was necessity. <laughs> uh, uh, SFAI Walter McBean Gallery is a very big place. And once, once we knew that we were gonna be putting artworks in that space, we knew that they all had to be large. Um, and so, uh, when we had, we had committed to that space as the works were being created, if I'm not mistaken, uh, almost all of these works, four out of five, were made after we knew that they were going to be in that space. Is that true? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I think that um, my incredible assistants, uh, Josh Stone Hall and uh, Jeremy Sabluski, um, they, they worked you know, tirelessly with me to try to figure out the configuration of the space and, and actual projections. Yeah. Um, Jeremy made uh, an incredible uh, maquette of the space, and we started putting images. Um, it, 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 it was it's site specific. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, if we showed this anywhere else, it would be different, and that's why I'm I'm a little nervous about this moving. 
Yeah. So it was something that was very, you know, unique about the cavernous feel of the, um, you know, the SFAI space, which is almost perfect for projection. Yeah. Um, and especially like large scale ones. And, um, and then we, we, we began to think about ephemerality, like the, the fabric, you know, the really like beautiful white fabric that the lane is projected on and, and how it moves and, and how it carries the weight of the imagery. Right. So yeah, I think that, it, I, I love that, that somebody um, referenced it as like a, a sculptural exploration because I mean, it's, it's the reason why, you know, it, you know, sometimes I'm, I wonder why I'm in the sculpture department at SAIC. <laughs> right. Um, but then we, you know, we start thinking about the extended field and, and what can be done with the moving image. Um, is something that you think is very ephemeral is in, in, in that space for this exhibition. They're, they're really kind of they, they're heavy. They're heavy ephemeral pieces. I mean, I'm walking toward like a, a, a mound with two hundred bodies in it. Yeah. And uh, you know, kind of taking that in and, and understanding the weight of that, it's it just like it just couldn't be against the wall. Mm -hmm. It made a lot of sense for it to be on this fabric and to be light. And I think I'm just thinking of levity. Uh, and, and trying to understand, like, um, and I think that show is a lot about that. I mean, we have like these two rooms where where people are preparing to kill, mm -hmm. and, and then and then we have an open space where we're kind of dealing with um, death in a completely different way. Yeah, it's almost like a, a thoughtful, you know, as we said, meditative like exploration. So yeah, it, you know, those videos fit the space because. Um, I think that was a way of addressing um, this incredible opportunity to have this show um, at the school. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, I think it's just to think differently about the, you know, the capabilities, the potentiality of, of these moving beyond the wall, or somehow that these these things like being able to to carry all of the the content of, of what we were trying to, to capture with the, this this red summer of nineteen nineteen. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't think we could put everything just flat up against the wall. Right. Oh, well, I created spaces, right? Yeah. Spaces in which people could come in, could come out, or, or take in the videos and, and the ephemerality, like, um, you know, different ways. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, we all knew that the subject matter was going to be so difficult and dense at, at, at moments that we really wanted to ease people into the experience that you had, you know, and I think start, you know, beginning with Elaine and, and moving into to flow it offers a, a meditation not only on the way in but on the way out like after you go and watch fire and movement and go watch this is not a drill you have this opportunity to kind of you know calm your nerves on your way out and, and deal with those those more tragic aspects with a little bit of serenity rather than uh, fight so I, I don't know I mean we, those are all things that we talked about from from the beginning, from when the work started yeah. to kind of come into, into, into uh, view. Yeah, I think it was, it, was, it was kind of beautiful about um, being a video artist is the flexibility. Yeah. You know, the flexibility of the, the medium. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, at the School of the Art Institute, we, we, we take videos and wrap them around objects and, and you know, yeah. and map them in. And I think that it's like, it's through this you understand, like, you know, you know, being able to, to see like these videos in one specific way or another, um, I mean, it kind of limits the, the potential of, of, of the work. So I'm looking forward to, to trying to see how we can replicate the energy and, and you know, the, the, the force of, of what we did in, um, in San Francisco and in other like, locations, but I can't help but to think it's going to be completely different, just like any movie show. Yeah, right. Um, but as far as the scale of the work goes, um, and we had the space. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we, I mean, we had the space, and also it, it made a lot of sense. I mean, especially when we, um, I guess we were thinking primarily formally in how we can occupy that gallery, but in the end, uh, it, it, even the sound just seemed to come together just right. marvelously. I mean, it's not like we, I would like to say that I planned for all this to happen in a particular way, but I think that, you know, we just had a lot of really talented people mm -hmm. on the team yourself included that, that really were sensitive about the work and, and the best way to, to, to show it together yeah there were there were a lot of great conversations even down to the last week where we just kind of struggled to find the best solution and agree upon it and execute it so 
I know these are yeah. these are my favorite collaborations. Always, always. Thank you, man. Well, yeah, I know, and I think that one of the things that I love about working with you is that you were open for any kind of spontaneity that would come in the last minute. And mm -hmm. I remember, like, you know, three months out, you're like, don't worry about it. You know, yeah. somehow uh, we'll come together and we'll come together and we'll be fine. And, and it was. You know, I think that yeah. that's the one thing that you're learning. Now, things aren't always perfect, right? But at the same time, uh, you know, I don't think that the show is lacking any um, vision or talent. I think that it all kind of comes together the way it was supposed to in that time. Yeah. 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 Well, and yeah, and and as Willis just reminded me, many thanks to uh, National Endowment for the Arts and Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts and Zellerbach Family Foundation for for putting forth um, a variety of funds to pay for the install, help pay a little bit for your guys, you know, help help move a little yeah. bit of money around for this exhibition. I mean, it's absolutely critical. This work wouldn't have been shown at SFAI without it. Like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have made that relationship. Yeah, we wouldn't have made the push. And if you don't mind, I'd like to thank um, Dashboard and Stephanie Reiser as well as the Guggenheim Foundation. Yeah. Um, that, that fellowship went a long way this summer. I had, I had a lot of growing. I'm so excited to see see um, what what this um, show, the physical work show in San Francisco at um, Pat Suido Gallery is. I, I, I hope yeah. we can talk about it. I, I look forward to it. Me too. I think that I, right now, um, as we move into the summer, I think I have to solidify some of these these ideas. But I am I'm, I'm excited about like this material culture from from a revolution. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I think it's a good time. It's a great town for it, actually. I mean, I love San Francisco and Oakland, and I love the, the day that, you know, it's funny because I always tell uh, Pat that, you know, I I moved to Chicago to be a little bit closer to out there, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> a little. I think, like, you know, I'll, I'll find myself out in California. I think it might be retirement, but. Yeah, well, yeah, we're, we'll we're, we'll all, we're all working towards something. I mean, it's beautiful. Come on. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, other than dealing with all the craziness with, with the boom that's this space now, when you argue that that's not one of the most beautiful places in the country. Oh, uh, you can't. I mean, that's why that's why most people fight to stay here so hard, despite every right. reason not to. Yeah. I mean, you know why people settle there. Chicago, I'm not quite sure. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the first person who came out to Chicago? <laughs> it's a big lake. It's great. <laughs> okay well uh thank you jefferson thank you all of you watching at home uh we're gonna do a second second saturday artist talk gee whiz i think it's gonna be on may 8th uh with um nasim Ogadam, which is gonna be really incredible and the first big install show at aggregate once that launches so uh thank you again for participating jefferson man oh man i know you're so busy i really appreciate you making this happen tonight yeah, thank you, Willis. I know you're behind the scenes somewhere. I'm not sure where you are. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for all your help. And, and Conrad, man, you keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I'm so proud to be able to, to point my finger in your direction and say, I, I, I knew that guy back in the day. Hey, <laughs> all right. That's, that's awesome. I feel the same way. I feel like I, I feel like the same way. Man, oh, man, it was great to think about I can't the, believe there's a, the telephone pole I can't pieces. I there's a curator out there that I'm not fighting with. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, gee whiz! I'm gonna have to. Let me let me get your information to use you as a reference more often. All right, all right, buddy. Thank you so much. Yep. Have a good night. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Who's watching? Oh, thank you, everybody.